alaikum, peace and blessings. Welcome to the Modest Beauty Podcast. I'm your host, Kalida the Model. And you're not going to believe who I have on my episode this time. I am going to allow her to not be so humble and really let us know where she came from, where she is now and how she got there. Um, my special guest today, as I call her Auntie Lubna, my special guest today is Lubna Muhammad. And I would like to allow her to tell us a little bit about herself and where she came from and how she got to up to the point where she decided she wanted to be a fashion designer. Assalamu alaikum, Auntie Lubna. Wa alaikum salam, Khalida, <laughs> and thank you so much for finally catching up with me, being persistent and consistent in getting me here to help tell my story. I really appreciate and love you for that. I, I appreciate you even making the time and allowing me to do this and be in your space yes. to receive the story and get all, how, how you come up with your inspirations and everything. So how did you start all of this in how your beginnings? All this? Your well, beginnings? I would say that um, even as a child, um, I was attracted by fashion. I used to make clothing for my dolls. And it sort of began that way. And both my grandmothers, so, so I'm from North Carolina. I was born in North Carolina. And when I would go back and visit them for the summer, that was the thing to do because other than nature and going out, you know, there was not a lot to do. So for my, I would make clothing for my dolls. So that was kind of where it first started. And that I would say, when as I got older in junior high school, I when you know you have home ec, mm -hmm. and so well, they they had it then then and now yes. they don't have it. Anymore, I know they don't is, have it anymore. Which is kind of sad. But <laughs> um, so I was able to get closer to fashion through my home economics class. When I made my projects, they came out really well, mm -hmm. and so that was in the '60s. Did yeah. they did they know? Or did you feel something? Did the teachers feel like this was something out of the ordinary than all the rest of the students in the class? Um, I didn't get the sense at that time okay. that I there was anything that was exceptional. Okay. I know how it landed on me and how it began to make me feel. Mm. And just the sense of a comp set out, you know, you make then we made vests mm. and little aprons. Mm -hmm. So but in making that vest and choosing the fabrics and Kalida, in the 60s, the fabrics, there was a lot of polyester, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of textures and colors. And it was a time where we were getting Java and African mm -hmm. prints on the scene. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it was exciting. Mm -hmm. It was exciting to make clothing and be a part of that. So I remember also making my first pair of, at that time, the high waist cummerbund bell bottoms. Mm -hmm and walking down the street and getting all of this accolades for like, <laughs> where did you get those? Did you make that? Did mm -hmm. you? So there's, there's this something that comes from mm -hmm. when people begin to recognize that whatever else that you're doing in terms of fashion mm -hmm. is making a statement. Mm -hmm. So I would say it sort of, it began like that. And you know how, how you get, you want more and more and more. It's like, I can do this, I can do that. <laughs> so. In junior high school, when it came time to um, move forward to go to high school, I chose the High School of Fashion Industries. Mm -hmm. So I lived in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and I commuted, com uh, commuted from the J train mm -hmm. uh, to Delancey Street to West 4th and my school was on 23rd Street. So you had a hike? I, every day. Two hours every day. That's what I'm saying. Minimum. You know, and, and people are complaining now that they have to travel a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. Yes. But minimally. I, as a matter of fact, I said that to my nieces when they were complaining about getting on the bus. Mm -hmm. I said, well, two hours if there was no subway delays mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. So, truthfully, it took me... Two years to get there, start getting there on time. Because <laughs> classes started at a quarter to eight. Oh, no. You were up and out like I six. I was up and out very early. But um, I didn't give up. And 
um, a lot of a lot of folks that I knew at that time, when you hear about this fashion industry, they think that it's just about clothing. Mm -hmm. But this school was about heavy academics mm -hmm. and seeing a project through. Mm -hmm. So I would say a lot of my foundation came from that. Mm -hmm. We had a school store, mm -hmm. which meant that the, pro the projects that we had in class mm -hmm. had to go to market. Mm -hmm. And the merchandising students would set them up. Our school was set up like a huge department store. Back then, um, there were big windows, and as you came up to the school, there were mannequins in the, the windows. windows. Yeah. So what what happened was it filled all all the niches and everything everyone was studying they got to bring forth mm -hmm. in that setting mm -hmm. so i went for fashion and one day my counselor called me down and talked to me and she says you know everybody's here for fashion i said yeah i know she said you should consider interior decorating <laughs> and i did and you didn't mind her telling you that, or that didn't feel, you didn't feel that did, deterred you from? No, or? because for me, I kept designing. Okay. Um, so I took interior decorating, but it was a, it was a boon in it. It was a blessing mm. because draping and all of that, the textures, the, yes. the trimmings and yes. all of that. You learned. I got from mm, interior decorating. That's right. that's and that's right. what makes my style unique now. Yes. Because when I go to a, to a project, the textiles inspire me first mm -hmm. before the design. Like some designers, they sketch. Mm -hmm. Some designers can only sketch. Mm -hmm. They have to give it to someone else to complete. Mm -hmm. But when I see fabric, I know what to do with that fabric. I'm not afraid of those textures, of those colors, of those patterns, of the trimming to add with it, mm -hmm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it would seem as though I was taken off the path, mm -hmm. but I wasn't. When I graduated, however, there were no jobs. It wasn't like HGTV is oh, now. Right. There wasn't, right. there wasn't a, there wasn't home decorating. Right, right. So either it was going to be corporate or for clients who mm -hmm. had that kind of money to have a decorator. And I wasn't in the circle for that. For that. Mm -hmm. So I went back to fashion. Um, while I was in high school, um, I met some brothers at that time. And I didn't know it because I was also, also belonged to a group called Black Unlimited, mm -hmm. which was very cultural. At that time, you know, in the 60s, everything was about yes. the culture being involved. Yes, that's right. You know, our strengths, mm -hmm. who are we as mm -hmm. a people? Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, so like you would always see brothers on the street from the nation, mm -hmm. brothers from this place, Sunni Muslims, You, they, they were there. Right. And you, and so for me, um, a part of that club or that group was African dancing mm -hmm. was a part of that. So there were brothers with drummers from the school and then some outside brothers from outside came in and I later found out they, they were Muslims. Mm -hmm. How'd I find out they were Muslims? When we'd have rehearsals, I'd hear them say stuff, things like, Alhamdulillah, hmm. mashallah, mm -hmm. you know, inshallah, mm -hmm. you know, Allahu Akbar. Hmm. And so I'm like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would get some answers. And the other thing I noticed was the esteem and respect mm -hmm. that they had. Because on, on the weekend, sometimes we would go to other events with them. And some maybe some of their wives or whatever was there. And um, there was another level of respect, I noticed. Mm. So, I was young. I was... About 14 mm -hmm, still. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my first year in high school. And I was with the African drum and dance troupe for a while, but I began to gravitate towards Islam. You know, someone would give me a book, mm -hmm, one of the brothers, mm -hmm. you know, give me that. They made sure I got home safely mm -hmm. coming from rehearsals. So 
other sisters that was in my high school also we're in this group we began to gravitate uh towards islam and like you said you, you felt that there was a different type of respect for you as an african-american woman yes that no one else was bringing that i mean maybe some people but that was really in your face like noticeable yes and it helped you understand or look at a different perspective because I don't I don't even well I was gonna say were Muslims at that time really it, it, it wasn't like it wasn't like we're oh they're Muslim okay let's you know it was more like hush hush right like it, they weren't but I, I wouldn't say it was hush hush because as you know at that time there were a lot of musicians who were Muslim right. you know Pharaoh Saunders um you know, uh, the last poets, oh, right, the, right. you know, so there, there were, and, and then there was this like hub in Brooklyn, this place called the East, uh -huh. um, where that, be, that was instituted another type of education, cultural education and school, mm -hmm. but they had all of these acts, performers that would come there, um, Gil Scott Heron. I mean, you know, just like the gamut. Oh, right. Fela. All, all of these ah. people were coming Ooh. to this space. Yeah. And my my friends, they were a little older than me, even though we were high school mates. They would take me to various places and expose me. Mm -hmm. So essentially, um, through meeting these brothers, I asked about, you know, so what makes one Muslim? What does one have to do? And they start saying, well, you know, you gotta, you know, you'll have to start covering up, oh. be a little more modest and all of that. And, you know, we, we wore African garments, but maybe it stopped here right. and maybe they were split up the leg right. and all of that. And it was like, and you no, know, you will be, you can't go and do this performing, dancing, you know, oh, like, like that. So I was like, oh, I don't know if that's for me. <laughs> but as as time had it, um, I got kind of got through that. So let me say this. Um, one day I was on my way to a rehearsal and we had rehearsals in Coney Island. And I was on uh, the train, the subway, going to rehearsal. And at that time in the subways, there was advertisements, like you could read all different things. And I saw this little girl in a chair and she had polio, wheelchair, mm. she had polio. So my backstory is that when I was three, I was hit by a car and I couldn't walk. I was hospitalized for a year. So I think essentially it gave me a level of becoming mature because I was left in the hospital like I had to kind of be there for be a yourself. year and I went through a lot of treatments mm -hmm. they told my parents I'd never walk again oh, the wow. bone was well I, if you imagine cars from the late 50s metal metal yes, heavy yes and it was hit and run and I was mm -hmm. you know little yes I was three yeah that's little that's so toddler <laughs> um but that wasn't what Allah had in store for me. You know, my father will tell the story that, you know, one day he came to the hospital to see me, which they did daily. And I was up on the railings walking back and forth, <laughs> you know. Um, the thing about memory is this. I remember being in the cast from my waist down. I remember all of those things. But I remember the healing that yeah. Allah, that came to me. Yeah. You know, so... As I was viewing the little girl on the poster right. with polio, right. that's me. Yeah. Why should I not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right. And it's not just that I can walk. Right. I can dance. Yes, 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 yes. After that tragic After accident. that. Yeah, After yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So that for me, so it was like this, this, I was a, I was 14. But that came to me in such a profound way right. that I knew 
I have to do this thing. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll worry about the covering yeah. and, and the dancing, dancing later. Dancing later, you know. Come. And a lot of people don't even understand, too. It's not like right away. But you you got to graduate Gradually, into, you yes. know, into it. And, and then, you, you know, you do certain things. Because that's, I think, where a lot of the sisters today and, you know, in the past... They, they they were like I can't do this and they, and, and people were like no you got to cover right now no you got to do this right no, now you can't no no it was gradual it was gradual well I'll say this so and when I came back uh, for my um, what is it sophomore mm -hmm. year um, I I came and I helped in the dance troupe but I didn't perform live on stage oh, okay. and then gradually as it comes to you. As you grow, mm -hmm. then the covering comes. Right, right. So, in our library in school, I used to also go into it because everything in fashion and where a lot of the designers, even at that time, got their inspiration mm -hmm. was from Egypt, mm -hmm. was from Morocco, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. from maybe from, mm -hmm. from, it's not as developed, Ghana wasn't as developed something. as now, but... Right places like that, different mm -hmm. things in Africa. So I saw the Moroccan woman, mm -hmm. and they had this face veil on. Wow. And I, I gravitated towards, towards that. And um, this was about, af about after about a year. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I started wearing a face veil, and then there were other sisters around me who asked me why, and I was like, and this is why. And um, I also had read some things about the wives of the prophets mm. and how they, they, when you speak to them, speak to them from behind mm. this curtain or mm. whatever. So loosely translated, but I love the veil. I just thought it was exotic. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it wasn't as if it was something that... Impressive. No. Right. I never viewed it as oppressive. Right. I still don't mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I can in see some cases, mm -hmm. I still don't. Right. But there are cases where it, it's, it, it can be a controlling factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I would, for me, it was not. Okay. So, um, so coming out of high school, like I said, um, I joined a group of Muslims in Brooklyn that were known as Ansarullah. Mm -hmm. And in because of the expertise that I had, I was at 18 in charge of a sewing department. Wow. So making uh, garments for, so actually in Brooklyn at that time for the organization, for that group, I designed the Jalabiya. That was something else that came from my inspiration from from the East, from looking at the books. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say loosely the Muslims in Brooklyn and other places, a lot of the brothers mm -hmm. did not wear long thobes. Right. It became part of the fashion statement mm -hmm. equipment, so to speak, mm -hmm. for men. Um, and at that time, like I said, I, I developed that particular styles and that's what so, the members wore. So, okay, before you even got to that part, mm -hmm. when you started covering, mm -hmm. how did you manage that? Because the, the reason I ask, because we don't live overseas. We didn't have access to long garments. They didn't really have long modest garments here in the states like that okay. we had to piece we had together. to piece things together right. so essentially what we did have available to us were a lot of indian garments okay there were and it went they were in fashion long tunics right. with flounces okay. beautiful paisley patterns okay uh, natural fabrics cottons right, right. um flowing pants okay. you know um because at that time the indians were here and they were in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we had those sorts of things. But they weren't modest though. 
where they then in this in in the fashion industry, but they were Indians, right? They were Indians. So they still had their arms out and the chest out and, so and stomach out. The tops came to the sleeves would maybe come to here. Okay. Sometimes you could find the long longer sleeves. One. Okay. Now the types of garments I'm talking about uh, in the mid to late '60s did have oh, Nehru oh, mandarin oh, collars. Right. Right. Did right. they did. May, they did close up. Okay. So there was that you could choose from, find some pants. Mm -hmm. In terms of Muslim designers, no, that was really kind of non-existent mm -hmm. in that way. A lot of the Muslims at that time just wore whatever was available. Right. And you put it together right. the best way you could. And then that's when your style and uh, skills and ability came, <laughs> came into in, play. Into play, right. you know. Because we wanted to, to remain fashionable, right. um, but at the same time, there's this, there was this modest look you wanted to try to achieve. Mm -hmm. And in being able to, to make my own clothes, like sometimes I would sit down and make something overnight mm -hmm. for the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was that easy. You just stay up all night, mm -hmm. or you know, <laughs> and you make something. And the same, we would do that for one another. Could you help me? Could you? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the market was at the time. Um, around that same time, I met one of my mentors, um, Mama Rakia Abdurrahman mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. She and her husband had a cultural center on Utica Avenue called Ethnomodes. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband, Bilal, was a musician, mm -hmm. like a jazz musician, oh, wow. and he knew a lot of artists. He brought in artists like, um, you know, uh, Abdul Malik and, and others, mm -hmm. but they had a cultural club in which I would see her um, show fashions, her and a friend of hers called Daria, mm -hmm. and they would show fashions and I would look in awe. But they showed traditional African fashions mm. because even at that time they had begun to travel mm -hmm. to bring back the uh, fabrics, textiles, textiles mm -hmm. um, she and her husband. Mm -hmm. So she was one, if I could say, she was one of the forerunners in terms of that. And she was uh, also uh, active at the State Street Mosque mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. So in you as as things go Kalida you begin to meet one person mm -hmm. then another mm -hmm. just and because your circle becomes a little bit bigger because you're meeting more people and then in this industry that you're in you're getting a little bit from this person getting a little, a little bit, bit from, from that, that person. person right and so just seeing uh Mama Rakia give shows mm -hmm. she was one of the first uh Muslims that I saw give a fashion show mm -hmm. and she would show garments from different countries mm -hmm. African countries ready-made or or somebody so she in sold the state. oh okay. she was a designer okay but she also they also traveled her and right. her husband they right. traveled to places and like she again she and her daughter Rakia uh, was one of the first people that I see had traditional authentic kenti cloth oh, wraps, wraps. Oh, wow. and that was in the 70s yeah 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 wow. it resurfaced in the 90s yes but they yes. had it back in and, the and 70s like you said authentic because some of that stuff that we saw later on was yeah was not yeah it was mass produced <laughs> and it right. was mass marketed right. and you know so um as things came along and I, like i said i was a part of the Ansar Law community, I was in charge of developing the looks and the garments and all of that. And I had a team, actually a team of women that worked with me. So it only served to develop and enhance my skill and also get the project completed. Mm -hmm. um, see it from this point to the end, yeah, right, right. you know, um, and I think in 19, I think it was 78, I, I moved on from that community 
and then decided, okay, so I have this skill, which means I can do this wherever I and go. And you've been perfecting it for probably, what, 10 years? You yes. You said 14, and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I left there, I think I was twenty two. Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, the takeaway, the lessons were um, doing things in a professional manner, mm -hmm. sticking with a project until you see it through, mm -hmm. and knowing that the the skills that I had and that I had gained from that work, um, I could take anywhere and do anything the, because I did really become a professional by the time I was 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's young. Yeah. That's really young. And I was ready to, because in that setting, we also made uh, clothing, sold it, mm -hmm. you know, got, took orders from people on the outside. So that was the other thing mm -hmm. because a lot, one of the big deals that people say, especially with, um, you know, would be with Muslim women or designers. They're like, you're never going to get anything back. <laughs> you're never going to get anything back. So, you know, part, that was part of, of, of that training. Yeah. Um, so, um, around that time, like I said, was when um, I started taking some of the garments that I made. My aunt helped me to buy... My aunt gave me my one of my first sewing machines at that time, even though I was used to sewing with an industrial machine. So is this the one when you said you were going to go and see, you told me a story that you wanted to work mm -hmm. to get this one particular machine? I went to work. <laughs> I went to work at a factory because I lived in Queens and on Springfield Boulevard, every time I go from my house to Jamaica Avenue, uh -huh. I would see back there, back there somewhere, they'd always have a sign, we need help, we need uh -huh. workers. It was a factory. Uh -huh. So I was like, I know I'm not a factory worker. Right. I, I, I knew I was never a factory worker, but I was like, I want this machine because mm -hmm. I love the one my aunt gave me, but it was didn't move fast enough. Right. To do. Mm -hmm. And I was trained in school on an industrial machine. We had mm -hmm. singers. So I went to take the job. Kalida, I worked all of, I no. Plus, I put a, I put a deadline on it. Right. I was like, you work eight weeks. By the time you work eight weeks, you should have enough money to go to Midtown and buy your industrial machine. See, this is what I'm talking about: determination and goal setting, mm -hmm. and and know where you want to go and how to get there. And you're gonna just allow yourself a certain amount of time. All of viewers and listeners out there, we need to take this because I feel like we don't. We don't do that now. Mm -hmm. We want to get there already. Already, yeah. Well, that's that seems to be how the industry is now. Mm -hmm. But um, really, in my lifetime, you had to go through the steps. Mm -hmm. It wasn't instant. It wasn't where I could just place things mm -hmm. in front of people mm -hmm. where they don't know the quality. And I don't care about the quality mm -hmm. if someone's going to buy it. Right. There was a standard for what made your project product acceptable. Right, right. And from 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 day one, when I stepped into fashion, the fashion industry, mm -hmm. that was what it was preparing me for. And even the work that I did for the five years in uh, in the Ansar Law community further prepared me for it and made me a professional, mm -hmm. you know, in which, so I never had to do one or the other, mm -hmm. even in the interior decorating, I always was always able to use those skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was always able to uh, use what I learned in terms of textiles, because mm -hmm. that was something we were also taught, oh, like, yeah. What makes, what are the finer fabrics? Mm -hmm. What makes silk? What are the mm -hmm. twists that make silk? What, uh, what makes linen? Mm -hmm. And what are the grades of linen? Right. You know, so essentially sometimes I find myself laughing when I go into a store and some, or, or into a shop and someone's trying to tell me what things are made of. I smile. Right. Because they're, they're just trying to do their job, I guess. Or they're so used to other people coming in that, that do don't not know. know. Right. That do not know. Right. You know. Actually, even on my last trip when I was in Morocco, 
I was in the shop and they had some wall hangings and I looked at it and I says, oh, this is not Moroccan, this is from India. Mm. And he says, he went and spoke to the other person <laughs> and said, then he came back and said, yes, Miss Lubna, it is from India. Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, I know, because that's, that's a, another one. I'm just going to say another one of the gifts I felt that Allah has given me, right. you know. Um, so that's kind of where it started. I met. A, so you're going to go now into time you spending in the mainstream um, industry. So, or I, okay, I can, so I can go in. So how I'm I trying to figure because I can stop it for a mm -hmm. minute, mm -hmm. and then we can have that as the first part, and then now the second part, we can. Uh, that's why I'm wondering okay. where you. So we're still start. in the '80s. Okay, still in the '80s. Okay. We're still in now. We're in late '70s, early '80s. Okay. In which, after I get my machine, it's easy to get customers because it's word of mouth, mm. right? And then I also made products. And took them out to, like, there were some shops. Back then, there was what they call African shops mm -hmm. or traditional <laughs> shops. Yes, or, I remember the African shops. You know, right. um, <laughs> Islamic stores. Right, right, You right. know, particularly in, in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and Manhattan. And that's where we would have to travel because, you know, I'm from New Jersey. So we would have to travel there because they didn't have that kind of stuff in New Jersey. Right. We have to go there. Yeah, they do now, but yeah, they oh, didn't yeah, then, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I would take some things by and say, you know, I have this, I have that, and you show them, and they're like, oh, you made this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I made that. It looks like, and I, and I love this phrase, <laughs> it looks like it's from the store. Mm -hmm. I said, well, do you know people actually make things that are in the store? Right. They're made by, made by other but people. people, right. But what they meant, and I knew what they meant, but you know, it was, it's the skill. It's, it's not the skill something level. they're used to seeing as a, a homemade right. dress or homemade outfit. Right. So, uh, of course, uh, sometimes it would be consignment, but I didn't do consignment a lot. Mm -hmm. I never did consignment a lot because I felt that people would never get the value of something when they were just getting it and they didn't have anything on the line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe once or twice, I would leave something, you sell it, now you see my thing sell, okay, so now let's make a receipt and mm -hmm. we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. So then I started getting offers, you know, can I repurchase this more and more? So um, I did that for a while and as I said, uh, it started, I started learning about people who were doing fashion shows. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the name came up, uh, a, a Muslim women's fashion show that's in Manhattan. They do it at the Harlem State Office building. And that was maybe 19, I'm gonna say 78. Mm -hmm. And this group was called uh, MEARC, Muslim Education Action Resource Committee. Mm -hmm. And that was Aliyah Abdul Karim and Karima Abdul Karim. And that's when I met uh, my queen's buddy, Amina Haq. Mm -hmm. Cause she was like, well, you don't drive, I'll take you there. Mm -hmm. We all, we will all go. And uh, at that time, uh, her uh, daughter was the same age as my daughter. Mm -hmm. And when I say her daughter, that's Dr. Suad Abdul Kabir uh, yes. and my mm -hmm. daughter Nawal. They, I think they're six weeks apart. Mm -hmm. So we put them in the back seat <laughs> in their little uh, holders. Mm -hmm. And we go to Harlem on Saturdays and have these uh, rehearsals for the fashion show, which time I met another fabulous designer. Her name was... Um, Fatima Al-Islam mm. and uh, a sister Wasima. And, and it just, you know, grew from there. I met from Newark. They had these sisters doing this routine, martial arts, mm. where they roll on the floor and roll out and like a uh, Zul Latifah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So <laughs> it was just now meeting more amazing women right. who done so many wonderful things and were growing and we all began to grow together, mm -hmm. help one another. Mm -hmm. These fabulous productions, like at first I didn't know what to expect, but my, my mentor, Mama Rakia, was also a part of it with her daughter. And, and like I said, they 
came with these Kinty cloth wraps. I saw the stuff that I was inspired by Fatima Al Islam. Mm -hmm. Her style was just so unique. The selection of fabrics, mm -hmm. just exposure to all of these new styles mm -hmm. and inspirations was amazing for me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, now I have to raise the bar <laughs> for what I'm doing. Right, right. Because <laughs> they're know? inspiring you. You're inspiring them and them. everybody's, yes. Yeah, so there was this like, okay, when we come to this again, my bar has to be higher, mm -hmm. you know. And not that it was a competition, but it was a standard that's being set. Mm -hmm. So... Um, something else they used to do, uh, at the end of the show, Aaliyah would come up and she'd say, now we're going to have an auction and they would begin to auction off. So like, say the garment would start at back then you could get a garment starting at, let's say $60 mm -hmm. and you had, because there was only one. Right. So the sisters would buy for these various garments and the price would go up and up and up. So... The next year, when I have prices, uh, garments going up over $130, $150, I was like, ooh, this could really work. <laughs> <laughs> this could really work out. Right, right, right. <laughs> because I'm looking, I'm going home. Right. I've got $800, $900 in my pocket from right. one, one day. Night. Right. That was big then. Yeah. You know, so I was like, okay. But not only that, it was an opportunity network. Because mm -hmm. now you mm -hmm. have a warm market. Mm -hmm. Your sisters see your work. And so they're coming to you throughout the year. Could you do my child's wedding? Could you do this? I have an anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just began to grow from there. This is from over the years, starting, I want to say, since 1978. Pictures in the actual places where we were getting the start. I recognize a lot of these people, all my aunties, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the pictures. And there's Auntie Lou. Thank you so much for joining us. Be fashionable, be trendy, be modest. Thank you.